Hello, today is February 27th, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. Harold Hagen at his farm north of Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Harold, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Well, you're very welcome. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, actually, I was born November the 18th, 1924, in a little town in Minnesota called Plummer. It's uh, a nondescript small farming town, and uh, I lived there for the first five years of my life. And, of course, that was a period leading into the Depression, and uh, so my father left a white-collar situation that he was in in Minnesota and moved west and took a job in a clerking in a hardware store in Jackson, Wyoming. And so I had the wonderful opportunity to grow up in Jackson, Wyoming before it became inundated with tourists and the way it is right now. Yeah. So I had the best possible uh, experience you could possibly have. Well, that's one question I always like to ask uh, before we get into your, your military experience, uh, the historical event of the Great Depression. Do you have much memory of that? And how did it affect your family? Or uh, did it? It didn't affect him all that much because my father was very, very adaptable. He could do almost anything. I mean, yeah, he was white collar in Minnesota. When he got to Wyoming, he did everything from building the superintendent to the National Park Service's house and uh, built a dam for the power plant and uh, went into the fur trade. Uh, he did just about everything to hold the family together, which he did very, very well. And how many uh, brothers and sisters did I you have? I had three brothers, no sisters. And how did you fit in that order? Uh, in the order, I was the youngest. Youngest. And, and talk a little bit about what life was like growing up in Jackson. It sounded like a wonderful time as a kid. Well, it was. It was actually, I had the best of both worlds. And it did actually shape a lot of the things that I did in the future. I mean, that I did after the war and, and later on in life because I lived equidistant from the best fishing stream in the United States, Flat Creek, <laughs> the same distance to the ski hill, Snow King Mountain. So in the summer I had fishing galore, in the winter time I had skiing like you wouldn't believe. So you couldn't ask for a better life than that. Wow. So it was, uh, it was about as close to perfect as you could find. Now had your family picked up skiing in Minnesota or was it something you learned? It was that... something we picked up in Wyoming. Wyoming? Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. And you went through the, obviously through the school system there in Jackson and graduated what? Uh, From the Jackson Wilson High School, I think it was in 42, class 42? of 42, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't remember the date, yeah. but I think it was 42. Well, so graduating in 42, uh, thus then, do you remember what you were thinking and, and what how you felt when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, probably as isolated as we were in Jackson, we didn't have all the newspapers, we didn't have an awful lot of information, but we had enough. We knew what was going on. And of course everybody was extremely concerned. I mean, war hit everywhere, so there wasn't anybody that was not yeah. affected by it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and your older brother went into the Air Force. Pardon? Your oldest brother went into the Air Force. Well, my oldest brother, Harvey, uh, he actually started training in private flying before the war, so that by the time the war really hit, he was in the uh, in the service, the B-25 pilot. But in his Air Corps. Okay. In the Air Corps, in uh, flying out of Africa. Hmm. But uh, he was killed. Oh. There was a sabotage. Uh, apparently Germans, <laughs> or somebody, got into the gasoline supply as they were ferrying B-25s down to Brazil and then flying across to Africa. Right. And uh, so he was killed early on in the war. So. so now once you graduated from high school, take your story from there. Well, I uh, was fortunate enough to have a four-year scholarship from the high school to the University of Wyoming. So I spent uh, my first, my freshman year, uh, just after graduation, I spent my first year uh, there. And of course, it gave me an opportunity, I guess, to make decisions about what I would do. I had the situation where I, I could have stayed out of service. 
Uh, there was a ruling, I guess, that if you're the youngest of three boys or something like that, that he didn't have to go into service. But um, my mother was not persuasive or didn't, she said, it's up to me, decide what to do. So uh, my older brother, just older, just older than I am, Tiny or Grant Hagen, uh, he joined the 10th Mountain Division. But, uh, he had good reason. It was just forming at that time, and uh, for, forming in here in Colorado, actually. And uh, he was a far better skier than I ever was. <laughs> a better mountaineer, better all the way around. But uh, I admired his choice of going into the 10th and considered it strongly as a sort of a funny situation in a way. Uh, while I was at the university, I was called in one day to the Dean of Men's office, Major Daly, who was the Dean of Men, and I thought, oh boy, they caught me for, <laughs> you know, something I had done that was pretty bad. <laughs> and uh, so I walked in and he said, I've got the best news in the world for you. He said, Senator O'Manny has made you his number one appointment to West Point. Made you? Made me young. Yeah. I bought, of course, fell over. I, I wasn't being punished. I was, I was uh, being offered the opportunity to go to West Point. Wow. Which I turned down, and I think it was a good deal I turned it down. Because uh, look at this, if I had gone to West Point and graduated, I had been out just in time for the Korean War. Uh, yeah. Which would have been probably a tougher situation all the way around. I've been lucky all my life, made getting the right decisions. So at any rate, um, I did decide after the first year then at, at the university that I would just get into the 10th bound. You had to have three letters of recommendation, as Mary said at the time, uh, to get in the 10th. And uh, so I obtained those and joined and there I was. So your decision was based largely on your brother? A lot of it was based on the brother and friends in Jackson. There were several friends in Jackson, Wyoming that joined the 10th Mountain. Oh really? Okay. Uh, and uh, so it was, a, it was a matter of people I knew, admired, and uh, so I, that was the selection. And then how much longer after uh, you enlisted did you, did you ship off? Uh, did you go right to Camp Hale or where? We went to Camp Hale, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, that was a fairly long experience there at Camp Hale. I, um, I was assigned to the 86th Regiment of the 10th Mountain Division, the 86th uh, Infantry. And uh, Company L was my company. And uh, so I was just a regular. GI, enlisting how, as a private. How was that uh, that uh, change uh, going from civilian life to military life? Was it much of an adjustment for you? I didn't really feel there was too hard an adjustment. I mean, certainly the discipline was more than than it would be in civilian life, but uh, you knew that was necessary, so you just rode with it. It didn't make all that difference. So it was not difficult. And talk about training and, and life up at Camp Hale, because and, and, it was a very elite program. If you could it talk to those people. Actually, it, it was an elite group. And uh, we had a lot of people who were world, world class, world famous in skiing and in mountaineering. And uh, so it was a pleasure, uh, in a way, to work with a lot of them. And there at Camp Hale, we had uh, excellent rock climbing. And when winter came on, of course, we had the skiing. Uh, because I had been involved in skiing both at the University of Wyoming ski team and, and Jackson and then in the high school team and all of that. Uh, I was asked to be an instructor. So I was a ski instructor. <laughs> I had good duty. I mean, uh, I actually taught the, <laughs> the brass, the commissioned officers for the battalion. And uh, if you know the way with brass, they the top one, the major would leave first, and then the, the lieutenants. <laughs> anyway, right on down the line till finally they'd all be off doing something. So I had a lot of free skiing on my own. But uh, but anyway, that was sort of a sort of a good duty. And uh, I also instructed in rock climbing when the weather changed from from winter to summer. I, uh, so that was something you'd done as well growing up. As yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I had done quite a bit of, of that in Jackson, so. Yeah. 
it uh, it was an easy transition, if it was a transition. And you said you had uh, various friends from Jackson and University of Wyoming, so you had friends up there. Did you, the it was your brother still yeah. up there as well? And so it didn't take long to get acquainted. Yeah. Uh, my brother was there, and I found out uh, when my oldest brother was killed, I was up there at uh, Camp Hale. And uh, when I got the message he was killed, they said, look up your cousin Sig. I didn't know I had a cousin in the Tenth Mountain. And uh, <laughs> so I did. I, I found him, and uh, strangely enough, I found him in the barracks talking to a fellow that I knew from Jackson, Paul Petzold, who was world famous in climbing, the first man to climb 8K2 in India, and Paul was a very, very well world-renowned climber, and he and my cousin were sitting together there playing cards on the, on the locker. So uh, it was interesting. I was not lonesome. Uh, how, how big was the camp, uh, personnel-wise and, and uh, such? We were all called a light division. So there were 10,000 of us approximately. I mean, plus or minus, mm -hmm, I don't know mm -hmm. exactly, but a light division would be about 10,000 men. Okay. And from what, I, from what I've read, uh, it was a pretty long training that they kept putting off sending you guys overseas. I mean, yes. talk, talk a little about that and when you guys finally moved. And yeah, it was, it was long training and, and uh, I think there was a lot of speculation <laughs> Not only on from us, we we didn't we did what we were told, of course, but uh, I think there was a spec speculation in the United States as to where our group would go, and uh, this continued. Actually, we left Camp Hale early in the uh, spring. What year would that be? We left and went down to Camp Swift in Texas. They moved the entire division down to Camp Swift which was hotter than blazing. Yeah, I was going to say, opposite climate and, uh, conditions. Quite a transition from going to the mountains down to, down to Camp Swift. And uh, the interesting thing was, it was very noticeable that we had a lot of Chinese officers that were mixed in and they were conspicuous in several ways. And I'm sure a lot of that was to show anybody who was watching that uh, we could be probably going any place. So uh, after Camp Swift, we were loaded on trains and sent down to Newport News and the East Coast and uh, boarded a liner and headed for Europe. We didn't know. Well, that, that uh, segment of the trip always begs the question, here was this landlocked boy from Wyoming. How was that, that, that sea trip for you? Did you get your sea legs or how was the trip across the, the Atlantic for you? Crowded. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, they only took our regiment first. I mean, they split the division up. And I suppose there were reasons for doing that. So my regiment was sent over first, the 86th. And, uh, but it was, yeah, that was crowded like they are on all troop ships. But what do you do? Yeah. But you, <laughs> you, didn't, don't. you didn't get seasick or had, had, no, had it, it personally? It was kind of humorous, though, on the, on the trip. When we boarded the ship at Newport News, there were Red Cross ladies standing there as we boarded the ship. And I was so loaded with gear, we had special equipment and all, I was so loaded about all I could do was stick my finger out. And she hung a donut on my <laughs> finger. And, and we landed in Naples, here were Red Cross ladies with a cup of coffee. So I had coffee and donut, but it took me a whole ocean to... <laughs> to get the coffee after the donuts. I thought that was kind of kind of an interesting, but uh, on the way we did what we could. We were of course not allowed um, to come up on deck too much. Very, very rare that we would be allowed to come up on deck. Now were you in a convoy or were you solo? We were in convoy. Well, but was there any not worries of a large convoy? Any worries of a U boat attacks at all on the trip over? Well we didn't have any problem that I know of. There could have been problems that yeah. I didn't know. We were, as an enlisted guy, you know, you don't get all the, yeah. all the big news. Yeah. But um, what would you do to for that that passage to pass the time? Well, all the downtime. There's always poker. What was it? Okay. <laughs> so, I got fairly good at playing poker. Yeah. yeah. And you said when you loaded the ship that you were loaded down with specialized equipment. What was your specialty? Uh, what would you 
trained for specifically, or were you just? Uh, we were all trained in the same way. But for okay. any eventuality, we had to be prepared, as I, I guess, for whether we were going to hit high mountain snow conditions or whether we were just going to be rock climbing to move across the Apennines. Uh, we didn't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were the last to know. Yeah, right. And where did you guys land? We landed in Naples. Naples, okay. Naples had already been taken. Okay. So it was reasonably secure. And we landed in Naples, and uh, then we uh, uh, spent, I guess that's where I was spending Christmas, was in Naples. And then we loaded on board a, an old Italian freighter at night, and uh, kept down below deck. We weren't allowed to go up at all. And uh, so we sailed. This was just uh, not the entire regiment. I think probably uh, 3rd Battalion. I'm not sure. Or, well, I don't know how many of yeah. us were on board. Fair enough. Not, but then a bunch of us were crowded in to this Italian freighter. And uh, we landed in Leghorn. Livarno is it in, the, in Italian. And uh, then Leghorn was close to the fighting area. So we moved from there on up into the mountains of the, the base of the Apennines. And uh, they didn't keep us in large numbers. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was a squad leader at the time. Uh, and I was just a buck sergeant squad leader. <laughs> I should have been a staff. They always kept telling me, well, the paperwork isn't finished yet. But anyway, it didn't make much difference. Uh, I was a squad leader, and so I had uh, about 12 men that, that I had, was in charge of. And for some reason, we were sent on all kinds of patrols when we got up there. It made it interesting. It was like chapters in a book, that rather than being quartered with the main part of the regiment, uh, or even the 3rd Battalion, my squad was singled out and we, uh, we had these patrol assignments. And, uh, sort of recon I, type of things? Or recon type of, uh, reconnaissance type of uh, patrols? or Yes, what? several of them different. I can refight, so, refight, talk about several of them. Yeah, please do, yeah, please feel free to talk they about were, anything. They were Absolutely. very interesting uh, to do. Uh, I remember one of the first ones was in the little town of San Marcello and um, we moved down into this town and ready to go up onto the end of the mountains moving up there and uh, we went by this door of a, a house somebody came up Benicui Benicui uh, come in and well we did you would guess you'd be polite and we so we went in and so they had a glass of vino and uh, I was a little bit suspicious there. I told him, okay, one glass, that's it, period. And uh, so then they started asking around the group, who was the youngest member of the squad? And uh, I didn't like that, but it turned out the young man from California, Ed Enners, uh, tremendous young man. And uh, he was the youngest, and. They sort of led him off into the corner, and uh, then they took the wraps off a radio, and we listened to Glenn Miller from Africa, and uh oh, here they had a radio, they were looking for the youngest guy, and this didn't look all the way we wanted it to. And about that time, up on a balcony upstairs, door opened and here came this little kid, he couldn't have been over four or five years old, and he looked and he said, oh Americans, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about the time he hit ten I had the squad out of there. Because I guess they were still, you know, they obviously fascists, so I did turn them in and apparently they were taken care of. Wow. Oh. But anyway, this was sort of you know, a lead into it that they were still trying to find out who we were. And uh, on some of the patrols, <laughs> after it was all over, I got to thinking that, you know, some of these patrols weren't 
really what they thought they might be. Some of them we were out looking for prisoners if we could find them. And, uh, but the others, a lot of times we'd be out into an area, sent into an exposed area, and uh, the German 88s would open up on us. <laughs> so I got thinking, maybe we were bait. Wow. Because it was very important for the reconnaissance, because I know the whole division was planning on moving into position as soon as they arrived and moving in to take the high mountain area that went down to the Po Valley because this would this is extremely important tactically to uh, take the, the mountain area to get to the Po Valley and on to the rest of Europe. Well anyway, that's neither here nor there, but uh, the, uh, the patrols then were of every variety and sometimes I took all twelve and sometimes I took fewer. But I can remember a few of them that I could recite that were kind of interesting, that uh, of the strange things that happened. But I remember one day we went up on this high ridge and uh, I'm not exactly sure what I was what we were looking for. But we were up on reconnaissance and looked across the valley and uh, here I saw a group of people across on the ridge coming down heading towards our lines. And immediately I knew that they were German. And so I signaled the guys and we all hit the prone position. And about that time the Germans across the the valley, across the big valley, saw us and they hit the prone. So here we were looking at each other with firing positions. It was too darn far for a shot. You couldn't do an accurate shot. I waved at them. They got up way back, <laughs> so they went down into our lines and we went on up into theirs. I mean, this, this was the sort of back and forth thing it was. Uh, I remember another one that was kind of interesting. We um, were into an area that was pretty touchy and uh, we had to take refuge in an old Italian farmhouse. and. Uh, we took turns standing guard at the doorway and I remember this fellow John McDermott from Idaho, a big, tall, potato-growing type of guy, his high squeaky voice <laughs> and uh, he was on guard duty in the doorway and all of a sudden the Germans opened up on us with their 88s and hit him pretty close to the doorway and here came John McDermott tumbling down the stairway. <laughs> I thought maybe we had our first casualty in the, in the group, but John got up and shook himself and cleaned off the dust and he said, getting mighty close, ain't they, Hagen? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for fun and, and humor mixed in with, with a lot of the things that were going on like that. Yeah, yeah. So, Tell them about the Brazilians. Well, that was interesting also, another little chapter, that um, there were several expeditionary forces in there, not just Americans. Mm. And uh, <coughs> uh, I was sent in one day to relieve a group of Brazilians who were out on a far point. And uh, so we went in there at night and they were in a, an old broken down house and a little ante room on the, on the going into it. So um, I had the guys stack their arms just on the outside because there wasn't room to be inside with equipment and, and we didn't need the rifles inside the, the building anyway. So we stacked them on the outside and went in and got acquainted with the Brazilians and they were happy to get out of there. And um, so they left and I, I had a funny feeling. Something wasn't exactly right. So I went out into the little annex and took a look where we'd stacked the rifles and of course they had American equipment too. So our M1s were missing and in their place were the dirty Brazilian oh, no. M1s <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> and so I took off down the hill. It was getting towards daylight. We didn't want to be exposed too much because there are always 88 shooting at the other place. Well, I'm going to interrupt you, Harold, for those that will watch this tape to explain, if you want to explain the 88, it was an anti-aircraft gun that they, they lowered down and shot 
It was very, very, very accurate. Very, very accurate and very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're the ones you were most fearful of. Yeah. <coughs> so anyway, uh, we uh, I took off down the trail as hard as I could go. Caught up to this Brazilian lieutenant. He knew what was happening when I got up to him. <laughs> Oh, mistake, mistake. <laughs> so we traded our or their M1s back to them and got ours. And anyway, I don't know how long we stayed there, but it was another interesting little chapter. Yeah, yeah. Um, Any idea why you and your squad was, was picked out to, to maybe do Maybe because we were sort of a different group. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Why? I, I'm really not too sure. Yeah. I can assume maybe there were squads all over. Maybe everybody was going back and forth, but I think we had extra duty. I'm sure we did. Hmm. And um, probably picked more than just about anybody. But we were short and fat and tall and skinny, all kinds of mixed up people. And so I don't think we were conspicuous as being a, you know, a very fearsome group. <laughs> but uh, we all had pretty good training, so we were able to negotiate the mountains pretty, pretty well. Yeah. But uh, that brings up another little story. If I can tell it, I probably shouldn't. But uh, after mostly most of the winter actually going on these different patrols, uh, they finally pulled our squad down and for some rest and relaxation. And um, they put us in an old farmhouse outside of the walled city of Luca, which is... Uh, kind of an interesting place historically, tremendously interesting. But uh, I can remember, and I don't know why, things stick in your mind. The address of the guy we stayed with, his name was Adolfo Spandoni. <laughs> Adolfo Spandoni Cassiano de Moriano, Comuna de Luca, Toscana, Italia. I mean, I've never forgotten that. I still, uh. sometimes it just buzzes through my head. Maybe I was going to contact him later, I don't know. But at any rate, uh, they apparently gave him and his wife some rations, so she helped us by cooking for us, and we, we did get some relaxation that way. But the funny part of that story was that we, uh, <coughs> two or three of us, one of the guys in my squad was uh, Joe Palladino, Italian. And of course, he was great to have along because he could speak the language. So Joe and two or three others of us went into the little outskirts of the walled city. We didn't want to go into the city. It was, they advised us not to. And I think it was good advice because you didn't know what would be going on in there. But um, here was a little restaurant. We were kind of hungry and a little restaurant sitting on the street there. <laughs> Uh, we walked in, there was a picture that had just been taken off the wall, you could, I'm sure it was Benito. So had, had Italy uh, broken from, from Germany at this point? Had they surrendered or were they still? They, no, they were still in the process. Oh, okay. Mussolini had not been, oh, okay. he had not been captured or strung up as he was later. He was strung up like a quartered beef. Yeah. But uh, at any rate, uh, they had two things. We, they took us to the back room because I don't think they wanted to see Americans eating food. It was pretty scarce. And, and so we went into this back room and they had two things on the menu. Either rabbit or eggs. Eggs 80, percent, 80 cents each or, or rabbit. So we ordered the rabbit. And they brought in some thin soup with a cabbage leaf floating on it. You could tell that the meat had been in there. And uh, so then they brought in the, the rabbit. And my first year at Wyoming, I had taken a course in anatomy. And I looked at the rabbit and, uh-uh, there's something wrong here. And then finally it dawned on me that the skinny bones and all of that we were having. We had alley cat. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so we, we turned back the alley cat and ordered the eggs at 80 cents a piece. So it was kind of a, kind of interesting, I can't... Uh, yeah. But um, anyway, it was, it was a, 
a good little experience of going through that. Well, along those lines, talk a little bit about uh, outside of that. Uh, what were living conditions like for you as far as your sleeping conditions, uh, food, and, and just generally general well, living conditions? Well, we got back to the main part of the, uh, of the company or even the main part of the battalion, uh, not all that bad. They ate a lot better. We ate an awful lot of K rations and C rations when we were on patrol. As a matter of fact, that's about what we lived on, our C and K rations. And uh, but when we went back there, then the food was good. I mean, our, uh, our company cook was right up there amongst the best. But uh, I can remember sometimes it was pretty tough serving. And I could sometimes eating at night on tables they would try to set up in these villages and uh, things swarming under the table. <laughs> oh boy. Not puppy dogs, little kids <laughs> going for scraps. Wow. wow. So uh, it, was, it was interesting. But. Now when you were out on patrol, would you guys secure a farmhouse to sleep in or would you dig foxholes or how, what, where would you bed well, down at night? Well, usually old abandoned houses. If we could get to them, if we didn't, we sometimes camped out. <laughs> but um, usually there were enough old abandoned houses, you know, along the hillside there that we could find shelter in them. Not always that comfortable, but were you able to? You felt like you got enough sleep during that time period, or were you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we must have, because a lot of times we couldn't go out, you know except at night to move from one place to the other if we were in a vulnerable spot. Again, where the 88s had, had some sort of control on us. I can I remember one time again about that that was kind of interesting. We talk about our being the ski troops and they built hundreds, thousands of skis and for our group. As far as I know, nobody ever went on, an ab on a total ski patrol. Maybe a few of them did for glamour shots or something, but uh, <laughs> no skiing. Hmm. But on one trip, we were going to go in for prisoners, and uh, they combined my squad with a couple of others. I don't know. I, I was not in charge of that, but they made me in charge of, of teaching guys how to use snowshoes. And here were the 10th Mountain guys that had trained on skis and Camp Hale, that's all we trained on. And uh, here they brought in, I think, about 50 pairs of snowshoes. And so I don't know how many of us were assigned to teach them very quickly how to walk on snowshoes. Hmm. And uh, so we went. <laughs> started out on this patrol at night with the idea of supposedly to gather prisoners and uh, it was awful. I mean, guys, you know, a single file going through the narrow little canyon and uh, <laughs> tripping on their snowshoes. And, uh, the night went pretty fast. As a matter of fact, dawn started coming on and about that time the 88 started coming in. But the snow was probably about a foot or two deep. And uh, so I don't know who gave the order, whoever was in charge, to off with the snowshoes and we stacked them next to a tree or a couple of trees and then took off on foot because it's a lot easier to get back down out of there. And I've often wondered when some Italian in the spring went up there and saw 50 pair of snowshoes stacked up against the tree. I mean, you know, what was this crazy event? What went on? Uh, I mean, uh, th there were a lot of things like that. Th yeah. There was a lot of humor in it, really. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So uh, you said a good part of the reason for you to do these patrols was because the rest of the, uh, the tent was going to eventually move up that way. Uh, did you guys eventually then move uh, yes, the front actually, lines? Yes, actually, of course, in time. Aren't, we weren't, you know, privileged to know what was going on. Yeah. But after our regiment moved in and we did into the patrol work and all of that, then the 85th and the 87th regiments moved in. And, of course, the idea then was to make a massive movement in to take the mountains that guarded the Po Valley and, and the route going into the Po Valley. 
and uh, there were some interesting experiences there. One of the routes going down, one of the main routes was right below a very, very steep little ridge called Riva Ridge, and uh, fortunately my group wasn't asked to do it, but one of the groups of guys that were pretty darn good climbers. The Germans didn't think that anybody could go up that ridge, so they left it, you know, pretty well unprotected. And uh, so a group of our guys went up the ridge, climbing at night up the rocks, and got to the top and overpowered the Germans and took over that position. That helped to clear one avenue going in. And then our job was to clear some of the other flanking mountains that were adjacent to them. And uh, I can remember then they started bringing up other other units, so we became more than just a squad, larger group. And uh, I remember the the night when we made the main push, heading up to take the ridges over the valley, and uh, that was kind of an interesting, kind of a tough assignment. Well, it had to be tough. I imagine trying to, I mean, be on the low end of the fight, trying to work your way up. We had to, yeah, we had to work our way up, up through. And it's tree covered as well as uh, rock, a lot of heavy rock in there. And uh, I remember when we finally got to the top of this one ridge, or very close to the top of it, it sort of leveled out. And the daylight was just coming on. And here was a, a haystack. I mean, you know, at that time of winter and no animals around, I mean, that didn't look right for the haystack to be there, and it wasn't. It turned out to be a machine gun nest and, and uh, with snipers all the way around, and, and there was a minefield in front of it. So it had a pretty good position in there. So that's where I ended my trip to Italy. Mm. I, uh, Harold, I got, you told me one time that you were on patrol and all of a sudden you got a radio call that the Germans were moving down and there was nothing they could do to help you. Well, yeah. We just had to stay up there until we found a way out. There were a lot of little things like that. I mean, just hitting some of them. We had all winter to go on these patrols. So, anyway, on that one where, where I got into that, uh, it was I. Um, I knew I was hit. Pretty, pretty hard not to know because I'm not flat on my butt mm. or my back actually. And uh, Eddie Enters, the big guy, was right next to me as being the the B A R. He was my B A R man, and. Uh, he was killed immediately, and I think that his body sheltered me. So, uh, anyway, I was in a position where I could, I could uh, see where the positions were or that were left that we hadn't taken out, and so I, I don't know who took over the squad. But we were able to get the squad in position where they could take the area out and then moved on. But that left <laughs> a funny situation that I knew that I'd been hit pretty good. Where, where did you get hit? Through the arm. Okay. And uh, I knew I was bleeding pretty good in there, but had a winter jacket which acted very nice as a sponge, you know. So even though got quite a bit of blood coming out, it would sponge up, and I think probably that was a very good, good situation, but we could see down below us, way down the mountain, way down almost to the valley, there were uh, guys with stretchers picking up wounded, actually picking up some of the Germans, which I did not think was too good an idea, but 
I tried to signal them to come up, and they would not come up. They just let us go, so it's, you know, you make a decision. I mean, you stay up there and wait till all the blood drains out or you try to get down. So, I, um, I rounded up a couple of guys that were still alive. And, and I took them down the mountain, went down through a minefield, and got down, and that's where we ran into these, the, all of the newsreel guys and all the rest of them were down below the mountain. And uh, so that, you heard that part of the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you were you in a lot of pain? Yeah, or, no, or are you know. running on I adrenaline? Think, or? I think I was probably full of adrenaline. Yeah, and pretty well shot. But it was kind of an interesting story about that. And I, again, my luck was tremendous. Very lucky person, my whole life. And uh, I don't know how I got the word back. But somebody got word back to me in the hospital that they had picked up my rifle from the uh, from that encounter, and it's the only M1 rifle that I've ever seen that had a curled stock. The wood in it was beautifully curled, mm -hmm. and what had happened? Of course, you go in, you know, in a firing position, either with grenades or, or firing. You're up here. And uh, why that bullet that went through didn't go through my arm, it tore the arm pretty good up, pretty good. Why it didn't go into the chest? Well, they told me what they found on the rifle. What had happened, apparently the bullet that went through the rifle was carried by the grain that curled and blew the butt plate out of my rifle. Hmm. So, uh, that was pretty neat. <clears throat> but then he got down and he went to an aid station. Pardon? You went to an aid station. Well, I finally got down where all this was happening, and there was a, an aid station there. And I went to the, into the door of the aid station, and I think I need some, some assistance. And, uh, uh, <laughs> The medic there looked at me and said, what's your regiment? And I said, Company L-86. This is the 85th. We can't treat you here. Can you believe it? I mean, I mean, I, I was flabbergasted by the whole thing. Particularly after sitting on top of the hill and watching them taking care of German. Took uh, care of in Germans. Actually, one of them I took off the stretcher. So, anyway, we... Uh, they said they couldn't take care of me. So I started walking down this roadway towards, I said, Where, where's the 86th? Where's an 86th medic station? And down the road a little way. So I started down there. I got as far as an army jeep. I don't know whether it was a general or what the hell. But anyway, I got to the jeep and I, I can remember crawling onto the hood and collapsing. And the next memory I had was in Leghorn, Italy, in a hospital in Leghorn. So it was, it was interesting. But you also told me you were lucky because you had that neurosurgeon. Oh, there in, 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 in Leghorn. Oh, I had the best medic in the world. I was able to sew the arm back together. So, uh, and that was kind of funny, too, because um, my passion in life was fishing and skiing, and you know you can't fly fish too well with a, yeah. with an arm that isn't operable. So that's where the surgeon put it back together. <laughs> and then later on in the other hospitals that I was in, I was in hospitals for nine months before I finally got out, and uh, they built a brace with a, a metal prod on here and attach it up on the arm while I was getting it to heal and doing the surgery on it. And uh, actually, I could even handle it fish when I, when I got back out. Hmm. So, anyway. Now, uh, during this time, uh, 
Where was your what? Where was your brother? Was My brother actually was assigned to the 85th, and uh, maybe fortunately for him or not, he's a tremendous. I'll show you some of his artwork. That uh, he was very very skilled in in art and in craft like that, and so they grabbed him and threw him into regimental headquarters. So he was traveling under pretty heavy protection. Oh, good. Good. Were you able to see each other during this time when you were overseas? He came to see me in the hospital in Leghorn. That's okay. the only time I saw him in, in Italy. Was oh, is that right? And you said yeah. you used to wave at the airplanes right. that went over because your brother, other brother was flying planes. Oh, yeah, my other brother, I had, I had two, I mean, the one was killed, and then the other brother, I have a picture of him there, he was uh, ROTC commissioned in the Army. And he didn't care too much for that, so he actually petitioned and, and went into the Air Force also and became a, a squadron bombardier in B-24s. They were flying out of Foggia, Italy, mm -hmm. and uh, they got Pulesi oil field and all of that were some of the missions he was on. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny. Uh, uh, during the daytime, the Germans would not move, and the American B-24s and others would fly over like that. And, but then when, when they went home to get supper, they had to go do that. The American planes all landed. Here came the German Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had to enjoy them for a while. So you, they'd come and bomb your... Uh, did you guys get bombed for Well, Germans? machine gunning. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Anyway, well, your your poor mom did did she ever talk about uh, after you guys were all back home what it was like? I mean, all you boys were in the service in harm's we way. Right. It must and have my been. My father had just died. Oh, <clears throat> he just passed away. He, well, you were overseas, or were you? Well, just before I joined the tenth, so it was more reason I could have stayed out. Yeah, yeah. Because she had no one but herself, but she was a very very, I don't know. Sufficient, self-sufficient person. But so, did she ever talk about her feelings after you guys got back? Particularly, probably sure. getting the telegram that you'd been injured and. Well, and she it, got that. I don't know. I really don't know. Hmm. She didn't. She didn't say much about it, but I know she was concerned. She yeah. had to be. Yeah. But, but she went back strong. to school and got <clears throat> a degree. Yeah, she went back to school herself and and started teaching, and then she took a job of. of uh, in Laramie, uh, a cathedral home, and teaching and taking care of that, so, so uh, kept her mind off things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so then from Leghorn, where, where did uh, talk about where you, the various hospitals you were transferred, and I eventually, I imagine eventually back to the States. But, yes, uh-huh. Yeah, I was put on a hospital ship after I was in, I was in Leghorn for, oh, I don't remember how long few weeks, I guess. And then, uh, I don't know whether they transferred me on down to Naples to hit the hospital ship or not. But the Seminole, the hospital ship Seminole, was the one that I went on. And uh, came back to South Carolina, Charleston. And uh, then from there I was transferred up to Vancouver, Washington, the hospital there in Vancouver, mm. where they did more work, beautiful work, and uh, and then after Vancouver, I was there. They decided to send me to Brigham City, Utah, which is closer to my home in Jackson, of course. Mm -hmm. And they had also very good surgeons and and good. Uh, it's a good hospital, Brigham City, a very good hospital. And that's of course where I contacted this girl that I told you about earlier. Yeah. That had recognized. Yeah, you may want to tell that story to, to those that'll watch this tape. It's a, a very interesting story. Oh, about that one? I yeah. Didn't, to repeat it? Well, we didn't get it on tape. We were just talking about it before we turned the camera on. That's, so. that's right. You want me to repeat it? Please, I think, I think people that'll, that'll watch this tape would find well, it fascinating. Well, what had happened was that when I was in grade school in Jackson, Wyoming, there was a right across the street from us, our neighbors, two young girls there. Their dad was a high school teacher, and uh, Carlin Goodman was her name. She apparently had seen a newsreel 
in which they had identified me that when I was coming down the road, kind of disheveled and all of that, as an unidentified soldier. And so when I was in the hospital, I got a letter from her. She had traced me all the way and recognized and traced me. I just can't believe how it happened. And they said, she addressed the letter by saying, Dear Unidentified Soldier. <laughs> and uh, so when I got back to Brigham City, it was a very short distance to Salt Lake where she was living then. So I went to see her and thank her for, for all of that. I'll be darned. Have you ever seen that newsreel of you? No. No? No, I'm sure it's long burned. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, she explained that she had had seen it. Why she recognized it at that time, I don't know. But then you had a date with her. Yeah, uh -huh. I told him that, that I had a date with her. Probably went out and ate hamburgers, we're not too flush. <laughs> yeah. and that's where we met Shirley Temple on the street. It was kind of a funny deal. Uh, uh, anyway. So, was, uh, so you were in all together, you said nine months in, in hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, is that then, were you discharged after you were, yes. or did you go back? Uh, to sir, uh, no, I was discharged from Brigham City then. From Brigham, from Brigham yeah. City, Utah. Yeah. So yeah. I immediately, we immediately went back to Jackson, Wyoming. My mother at that time was, uh, she had rented her house, so she didn't have a place there, nor did I. But um, we had family friends, the uh, Hyder family, the, uh, a fairly wealthy family, quite wealthy, from somewhere in the east. And they had a ranch, the Bear Paw Ranch, which was uh, right next to Phelps Lake in the Teton Park area. And right over the hill from the Rockefeller's Ranch, which was on Phelps Lake. And uh, so they asked me to come and stay there. And a woman, a family friend, her, their son was one of my best friends in school, uh, Martin Murray. His father was a very well-known scientist and biologist, O.J. O. J. Murray. And uh, so she was on the Bear Paw and the Hylers wanted me there. And anyway, it was it worked out beautifully. And what a way to strengthen my arm. <laughs> yeah, how was your arm at this, at this point? <laughs> well, it was okay. Yeah. Not, I mean, I adapted so it was okay. But anyway, I landed fish pretty regularly with it. Oh, good. So that worked out just fine. But anyway, they let me stay there. And then uh, later on, when I went back to school, I uh, went back to the University of Wyoming and got a degree, bachelor's degree in fisheries, fishery and wildlife. And, uh, and I found this little article that I thought was kind of interesting. Two brothers go mountaineering on opposite sides of the globe. Oh, that's about my brother and... And Harold. Take it, Harold. Oh. Well, Tiny was climbing... The Grosslock, Grosglockner in Austria. He took yeah. time off to climb it. Oh, is that Harold right? Harold was climbing Buck Mountain. Well, he, he was better to... And he climbed 3,000 feet of it to ski down it. And they wrote it up in the paper, that huh. the two brothers... Well. We're doing Pretty it the sure, same sure. day. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's an article I was in the paper. Yeah. Anyway, it was... So you, you got your degree from the University of Wyoming and then... Uh... I went to the University of Wyoming, got my bachelor's degree. And uh, then I decided to go on in fisheries. So I went to the University of Washington and uh, picked up a PhD at the University of Washington. They let me skip the master's, which was nice, because it saved time and just go directly from bachelor's to PhD, hmm. which um, worked out real well. Harold, didn't you go to Alaska, though, and huh? work for a while before oh, you I went worked, to Washington? I worked for a while, yeah, in different places. I had to work long enough to get invited to drink coffee with these Park Service guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. I spent 17 years actually working in summers with the Park Service, but this was after I finished the PhD and uh, incidentally I did my thesis on Phelps Lake 
which is where I went fishing, mm -hmm. and there's a species of fish in there where they're not too much known about it, the Rocky Mountain whitefish, Prosopium williamsoni. And they didn't know about age and growth, nor did they know it's spawning or anything like that, so I used that as my dissertation and uh, built a weir across the lake creek and skied in there all winter long studying studying that fish before I wrote it up. But anyway, it, that worked out just fine. So uh, then I, I, my first job was actually in fisheries. I was, South Dakota wanted to hire a fishery biologist for the Black Hills, so I applied for that and went and took the exam and lucked out and got the job. So I became the first trout water biologist in the, for South Dakota. And about that time, a job opening came up in Colorado State University. And so I put in an application there and uh, was accepted for the position. So it was a good, a good position because it was a nine-month job, only the academic year nine months, which let me have all the summers and vacation periods to do all these other fun things. So a lot of the fun things were working. About that time I had met Mary, which was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. She was out skiing and broke her ski binding, so I, I had to fix that. Fix it for me. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, we, um, we took the job at CSU and I worked actually <laughs> I worked a lot of years there, 50 years. 50 years at CSU, yeah. is that right? Yeah. And that has a funny story to it also. I probably shouldn't keep digressing into no. all of this. No, stuff. no, please do. But uh, I remember when my 45th year came up at CSU, they had a big assembly of all the faculty, and the president was up there on the stage making all of these, and they had a couple of pictures sitting on the stage. Well, a fellow in mathematics, a very good friend of mine, Elmer Remingay, uh, who's a statistician, he was 45 years and I was 45 years. So they recognized us, recognized us and uh, we were each given this picture with a little doodad on the bottom of it. And mine was a mountain sheep, which is very appropriate for CSU. Well, then I went on and just kept on for another five years. And by that time, I was the only, uh, <laughs> only one that had gone 50 years. So they had another big one. So they had it on the stage, and here was another picture. And I, I looked at the picture, and this can't be. So they went ahead and made the presentation. It's the same damn picture of the mountain sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so I got two of them, one at 45 years and one at 50. <laughs> but anyway, I used that time to good advantage because, as I said, I grew up in Jackson where my passions were skiing and fishing. So taking my advanced degree in fisheries, and it worked out that about that time I guess they needed fishery people here and there, so a lot of agencies uh, hired me, and a lot of it was overseas work, so I spent a lot of time in Central and South America mm. working for different agencies. The uh, Republic of Chile, for example, was very interested in the, the possibility of farming salmon, because the mountains, the Andes, and all of the water coming down from there, there was a possibility of mixing with seawater and making a good media for, for salmon farming. So uh, the World Bank asked me to go down to, uh, to Chile and look at that and make a recommendation as to whether or not they should lend money to Chile. Well, that was neat, real neat, because I got treated like royalty. It was a funny thing I, when, I, <laughs> when I got to <laughs> Santiago, I mean, like, yeah, Santiago, the minister, one of the ministers came from the country in there to see, you know, get, make arrangements for me to go to Port Amont and all these areas for, for looking at it. And they assigned an interpreter. I couldn't speak Spanish, of course. 
So the entire, uh, to Mario Puentes, and uh, we loaded aboard this plane and flew down to this area where they were interested in the farming. And the plane was absolutely loaded with military. Chile at that time, and I guess still is, mostly brass military. And uh, just all over the place. And so Molly and I were sitting in the back of one of those British planes that have a rear entrance and a front entrance. So we pulled up on the tarmac and looked outside and here was a, a band, military band standing there. So all of the brass got off the front of the plane and they went by and saluted the military and the band stayed, stayed there. And, uh, Mario and I finally decided we'd jump off and see if we could get a taxi into town or something. So we went by this band and this officer came up and he said, pardon me, do you know if there was a Dr. Hagen on board? <laughs> <laughs> Mario pointed at me like that and then the band started playing. Huh. <laughs> I mean, these are funny things. <laughs> it wasn't for the military, it was for you, the band was for you. The band was for me, of all things. I mean, I. I deserve it like nothing. <laughs> well, so, <clears throat> he was instrumental in starting the salmon industry in, in Chile. In Chile, I actually made recommendations to the World Bank to lend them the money. And they are the number one salmon producing nation in the world. Is that the right? Time, yeah. uh, so, a lot of times now in the grocery store, if you buy salmon, it'll be product of Chile. Well, that was fun. Was oh, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting assignment. Yeah. But, uh, that worked out well enough. They were, the other agencies got a hold of me. The uh, State Department wanted me to look at a project in Peru, which I did, and I assembled a group of scientists from CSU, and uh, I went down there and looked at what would be some potential for using the high mountain area. One of the big problems they were having in Peru was all the young men were moving from the mountains down into the city, and the city was just oversaturated with people out of work. And how can you keep them back in the mountains? And the one possibility was by building trout hatcheries. So that's what I did. I designed some trout hatcheries, and we got some CSU types to go down there and build up a program, and, and uh, that worked out real well. Hmm. Wow. Um, then I had other assignments. I worked for the United Nations. They wanted me to come and work for them. So I did that. And then, uh, oh, the Peace Corps asked me to come. And I went two places for Peace Corps, didn't I? Before they got unpopular. What did you go to Ecuador for? I went to Ecuador for, I don't know, whether that was Peace Corps or World Bank, I'm not sure. Maybe United Nations. Anyway, it was. Oh, sounds like anyway, a fascinating career. It was it was a fun career, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was they just didn't have a lot of good fish types, I guess. They needed somebody to talk about fisheries and yeah. I talk. <laughs> <laughs> and you were in Guatemala. Oh, yeah, I went to Guatemala also. I think that was for Peace Corps. And you were in Jamaica. Yeah, and I went to Jamaica, yeah, for that was for the <clears throat> State Department who went to Jamaica. But they had a poverty situation as well, and uh, so they were. They had imported some ideas from the U.S. on farming for tilapia, but they were using some of these, like they do in the South, for catfish farms, great big bodies of water, and uh, so it didn't take a genius to go down there and take a look at if they're going to raise tilapia. What was happening was they were building them fairly close to the coast and the water as it evaporated from the surface in the hot climate would pump water from the ocean. And so it was pumping water up along the side and was killing sugar cane. And they didn't know what was wrong. So as I say, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very big deal. I just decided, I told them to let's cut these rather than one big pond, let's make them five or six ponds, and cut down the evaporation and made it easier handling anyway. So anyway, those were some of the kinds yeah, of projects yeah, I got into. Yeah. 
Now, did uh, your work ever take you back to Italy? Did you ever get a chance to retrace we your steps? Italy, as a matter of fact, on that picture That's there. That's what the article is. There's a reunion <clears throat> with the article on that. So, yeah. through the years, then, you uh, went back to uh, 10th Mountain Division reunions, yes. and, and yeah. did you keep in touch with buddies through the years? Very definitely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we have a uh, memorial every Memorial Day. We meet at Camp Hale, and that's a funny story, too, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> you're talking to a dead man, and you probably didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> You got me fooled. We, went, we had a memorial there for the for the, the killed in action in, in the 10th Mountain. And about one out of every 10 was killed. Oh, boy. So we had a big memorial there of Italian stone with all the names inscribed on it. And uh, I was standing there with one of my very best friends, Bob Creer, who now lives in Estes Park. And right next to us was our commanding general, General Hayes. And we were going down through the, some of the names of people that buddies we lost there. All of a sudden Bob just screamed out, he said, My God, Harold, he said, There you are <laughs> What was going on? So I looked at it and sure enough, here was my name on the on the memorial to the KIA. Huh. And uh, the general was standing there and he looked over at me and he said, You know you look pretty good to me for a KIA <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they haven't taken it off. They threatened to take it oh, off. Oh, is that right? It's so still on there? If, if you ever go by Tennessee Pass, you, you stop and my name is, is on the memorial. I'll line. be done. Uh, so I ready. have to tell you something. We were going to go to Europe and he couldn't get a passport because they didn't have any record of his birth because he was originally named Donald. <clears throat> but anyway, I guess the courthouse burned down. And I'm worse than Obama in getting a pass. So I, I told Harold, I said, you're the only person I've ever known who's never been born and is already dead. <laughs> yeah. Which is rather unique. Yeah. 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 They wouldn't accept his discharge papers. Uh, Isn't that something? Uh, we got it straightened out. Yeah. Now, there was quite a few famous people in the 10th, uh, Bob Dole, and, and a lot of, uh, isn't uh, a lot of people that started the Colorado ski Actually, industry. one of my very good friends started Vail. Peter Seibert. Pete was actually the the instigator of Vail, and uh, a lot of the others started several of the resorts around the country. Yes, hmm. I wasn't smart to do that. I I built fish hatcheries instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, were you able to, with your injury over the years, were you able to continue skiing? Did oh, you yes, ski through the years? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that's he yeah. climbed that mountain with his right, oh, right after yeah. his injury. It's just within the last few years that I've... That was my next question. Does it give you trouble at all, your injury? Has yeah, it through it the does, years or just recently? Well, I, can't, I can't lift my arm and I can't. And he can't use his hand. I can't use it to write or hmm. eat very well. I spill coffee, don't I ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, well, we'll start to wind down this interview. Uh, I wanted him to tell you one thing that was funny. Well, that's what I was uh, going to say. That if there's anything we didn't talk about, let's uh, please bring it up, uh, Mary or, or Ken. If there's any stories you've heard through the years that he's left out, hopefully we can we can round out as best we can your stories. So open it up. Harold, where were you when the British officer drove up? And... Oh, I was on one of my patrols. Yeah, we were. It was rough country, really kind of bad terrain and everything else, way up high, and uh, here we heard this chugging noise. And here came a British vehicle, four-wheel drive vehicle. At that time it was a pretty rare thing, and on the back end of it was a teapot. It was hanging there, the mat, you know, where the exhaust comes out, there was a teapot. So it stopped very close to us, and here came this British officer, stepped out of it, went over there and he had his orderly take off the key pot. He took a chair, one of these folding chairs out of the vehicle, and sat there looking at the scenery and drinking tea. Clear <laughs> back of enemy lines. <laughs> I mean, those Brits or something. <laughs> uh, Ken, is there any stories over the years as you guys met for coffee? No, I've like, probably told I've them heard all. more today than yeah. I have for the last five years. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you had right. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> It's all a lie. 
Well, <laughs> this was the ship that Harold came home on. Okay, and we'll, we'll certainly, uh, at the end of the interview, we'll pull out uh, the camera and we'll videotape any pictures that you want to okay. put on, for sure. Well, yeah. I thought you might like yeah. to see that. Okay. And, and this is his mother and Harold and He's his brother, brother Tiny. Tiny. Okay. He died on the operating table. He was too young. He was doing very well as an artist, and then, then he um, had a heart problem and died. Hmm. Yeah. And then this was Harold. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, we'll get that on the tape. And how about you guys? Uh, how long? How many years have you been married now? Sixty-three. Some years. Yeah. Sixty-three years. Children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. We have one child. Mm -hmm. We have one Cal, child and, and we two have grandchildren. Two grandchildren, and we have. Uh, a grand, a daughter-in-law and two step-grandchildren. So, f four all together then? Uh -huh. Okay. Now, and one question I like to always ask Harold at the end of these interviews: How do you see that period of your of your life, uh, your war experience? Did that change your life at all? Affect your life at all? Uh, play a part in your life at all? Or was it simply just a chapter of your life you went through? How do you? How would you answer that? I would say it was a very important part of my life, and I think every ninety percent of it was positive. I'd say very little negative from it. Some of the experiences were not not great. Losing very close friends; uh, those are not good experiences. But uh, I'd say the vast majority of the experiences were were useful to me. They helped. And, uh, and, and like in what sense would you say? How would you, why, why do you say that? I mean, the what? In, in what sense did it, was, it, was it helpful for you, the experiences? I mean, how would you answer? Well, everything from probably uh, early maturity. <laughs> you learn pretty fast that, you know, life is, is a pretty serious game all the way around. So I did actually use a lot of the Army experiences, perhaps to use enough diligence to get a lot of the things accomplished that allowed me to go on a lot of these other things where they found me useful, put well, it that you, way. And, and you got your education. I got my education. Able to use the GI, the GI Bill? Bill. Okay. I uh -huh. used that and i uh, very, very thankful for it. Um, I'd say yes, it was very, very useful. Okay. Okay. I, a lot of the friends are still ex extremely good friends. Um. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, you're certainly welcome. I, there were a lot of others involved, believe it or not. Yeah, well, well thank you. <laughs>